Understanding arguments, identifying key parts and their relationship. Now that you know that critical thinking requires you to step back and carefully examine claims and arguments logically, we can dig a little deeper into what that means. As you know, critical thinking allows you to apply reason or logic to evaluate something you read, hear, or see. Most often, people use critical thinking to evaluate an argument someone has made. By thinking critically about an argument, you can analyze the argument and conclude whether you think it's right or wrong, strong or weak. But before you can analyze something you've heard or read, you must first know whether it's even an argument or not. Now, this may sound obvious or easy, but as you'll see, that's not always the case. So, what is an argument? First, it's important to recognize that an argument is made to address a specific problem or issue by offering a position on the problem or issue and providing reasons for that position. At its most basic, an argument consists of two parts. One, one or more premises, and two, a conclusion. These two parts must work together in order to offer a particular stance or position on an issue or problem and form an argument. In an argument, the premises supposedly provide the reasons the person has for thinking the conclusion is true. For example, a student tells her instructor, my grandmother died and I had to miss class to go to her funeral. The issue or problem at hand is whether the student should be excused from class. Now the student believes the conclusion is yes and offers a reason, attending her grandmother's funeral, to defend that conclusion. That reason is the argument's premise. The instructor can then evaluate whether she has offered a good argument or not. To evaluate means to do two things. First, decide whether the premise or premises are true or accurate, and second, determine whether the premises are logically related to the conclusion. In future modules, you'll learn more about this evaluation process. We're going to break down the definition of an argument by focusing on four key points. One, the premise. Two, the conclusion. Three, the application of reason or logic. And four, the relationship between premises and conclusions. Premises. When someone makes an argument, they are offering up their position or stance on some issue at hand. For example, imagine one of your classmates is currently taking a course you were thinking of signing up for next semester. When you ask if you should sign up, he says, oh no, no way, do not take Business 1050. In order to convince you that this is true, that you should not take Business 1050, he'll give you one or more reasons. He might tell you that the professor is boring, or that the readings are too hard, or that there's not enough time for discussion. The claims about the class are the premises of the argument. They provide the foundation on which the conclusion that you should not take the class rests. In order to analyze an argument, one thing you must do is identify the premises. Ask yourself, what reasons or evidence did this person give for their conclusion? Or why does the author think that this is the answer? Sometimes, the person making the argument will make it easier on you by using keywords or phrases that indicate a reason. Because, due to, as shown by, given that, and so on. Be aware of such words, but don't rely on them. They won't always appear in an argument. In addition, there are sometimes unstated or implied premises. The person making the argument may leave out a fact or reason, assuming that you already know that fact or that it will be taken for granted. You'll learn more about these unstated premises later. Once you've identified the premises, you will then need to evaluate their truth or strength. We'll talk more about how to do this in later modules. Conclusions. Now let's make sure we're clear on what the conclusion of an argument is. In this context, the term conclusion is being used in a different way than you might be familiar with. When we talk about the conclusion of an argument, we do not mean a summary or overall review of what's been said, as might be meant when your professor asks that your paper include a conclusion paragraph. Rather, the conclusion of an argument is what follows from the claims being made. It's the final statement of the position someone is taking on an issue or question. Imagine you're having a discussion with your supervisor at work, and the supervisor says, I'm thinking we should have a staff retreat. Now, thinking about how things have been around the office, you reply, yeah, it seems like some people aren't getting along very well. 
and we have these really, really important projects that aren't getting done because no one is working on them. You also believe that staff members are not communicating very well with each other. Now, having considered a number of premises related to the state of office affairs, you then offer the conclusion that, yes, we should have a staff retreat. Note that your supervisor can then critically examine your argument, evaluating both the premises and the conclusion. He may agree that your premises are true, but that does not mean that he necessarily needs to agree with your conclusion. He may decide that your premises do not provide enough reason for having a staff retreat and losing time and productivity by taking a day away from regular tasks, or that there's a better way to resolve the office tensions that you've identified. Reason. In making an argument, an individual relies on reason or logic to defend a particular conclusion, rather than on emotion, intuition, or instinct. For example, an employee who tells his boss, please give me a raise, I really need to make more money so I can buy a bigger house, is trying to appeal to his boss's emotions, hoping the boss might feel bad for him. And whether he needs a bigger house or not, the employee is not really offering an argument as to why he should get a raise. He's simply trying to persuade his boss to agree with his desire. In order to actually make an argument, the employee could outline his workplace accomplishments, projects he's initiated, deadlines he's met, and other concrete reasons that could justify a raise. Now consider the defense attorney who, pointing to his clean-cut, well-dressed client, asks the jury, tell me, does my client look like he's capable of murder? Is this an argument? Has the attorney offered the jury any actual reasons by which to draw the conclusion that he would like them to draw? That no, of course he's not capable of that? Certainly, the person paying the attorney likely hopes he has more to offer the jury by way of reasoned argument and evidence to defend a not guilty conclusion. Relating premises to conclusions. Remember the use of the term supposedly in our definition? A premise supposedly provides a reason for thinking the conclusion is true? When someone makes an argument, they believe the premises they offer justify or support the conclusion they've drawn. However, the point of applying critical thinking to arguments is to evaluate whether that is in fact the case. Does that premise really lead to the conclusion? If the argument's a good one, the answer is going to be yes. If it's a weak argument, the answer might be no. Remember when you asked your classmate about taking a certain class? Imagine if instead about telling you what the class was like, he says, Oh, no, no. Do not take that class. I hate that class. It's so early in the morning, and I am not a morning person. In order to support his conclusion that you should not take the class, the premises are that A, the class meets early in the morning, and B, he does not like mornings. Now, do those premises really tell you whether you should take that class? What does your classmate's dislike of mornings have to do with you? So when you analyze an argument, you must not only evaluate the premises and conclusions separately, but you need to consider the relationship between them. If the premises do not directly address the question at hand, in this case, should I take this class, then they do not really offer support for whatever conclusion is made, and therefore you have a weak argument. The missing link, unstated assumptions. Sometimes, it can be difficult to tell whether someone's making an argument or whether the argument they're making is a good one because pieces of the puzzle are missing. People do not always explain their arguments very well. Have you ever heard the phrase, it goes without saying? That it is an unstated assumption, a premise that, for some reason, is simply assumed rather than explicitly stated. For example, consider the following argument. It's not required for you to do an internship. You would rather spend your summer at the beach, so don't do an internship. The unstated assumption here that goes without saying is that people should only do what they want to do. You want to spend the summer at the beach, therefore you should do that instead of getting an internship. In the example discussed earlier, when the lawyer asked the jury if they really believed his clean-cut, respectable client was capable of murder, he made the unstated assumption that people who look respectable do not commit murder. The problem with unstated assumptions is not that they are or are not true. The problem is, if they remain hidden, then your analysis of an argument is incomplete. Not all unstated assumptions will be true or accurate or reasonable. 
if you do not bring them out of hiding by figuring out when some piece of an argument is missing and fill in the gap, then we may miss a weakness or error in reasoning that can undermine the argument's conclusion. If you're the one making the argument, if you leave some premise unstated, someone else may fill in the gap for you, and they may not fill it with the same reason you would have used. In this case, you're allowing someone else to make your argument for you, to put words in your mouth that might not belong there. In both assessing and making arguments, you should always be alert to what is not being stated.